I think what Musk is doing is driving them crazy, which we like to see. And it, it's it's always fun to watch the left reveal who they really are, which they are fascists deep down inside. They they, they demand obedience. I uh, advise everyone to go on their site and look up Great Reset videos and have some young, happy, chirpy 20 something say, you'll own nothing and be happy. Hello, I'm Jonathan Tobin, editor in chief of the Jewish News Syndicate, JNS.org. And you are listening to Top Story, a weekly podcast where I analyze the most important stories happening in Jewish news around the world. Each week, I will break down politics, foreign policy, and culture to provide insights into what is going on behind the headlines. Hello, and welcome to Top Story. Thank you for joining us. Today, we have a fascinating interview with you for you with author Michael Walsh and a discussion about the so-called Great Reset of modern life that global elites are trying to implement and how it affects everything in our lives and just how much we should be alarmed by it. But before we start, I want to encourage everyone to like this video and podcast, subscribe to JNS, and click on the bell for notifications. Also, we would love to hear from you. Please write to us at editor at jns.org and let us know where you listen or watch the show and what you think about it. We also want you to be aware that you don't have to wait a full week for more Top Story analysis. I'm now offering a daily Top Story podcast so that I can share with you more news and analysis about the most significant issues we're facing today. You can find the Top Story with Jonathan Tobin on the JNS channel on Apple, Spotify, Google Play, or wherever you get your podcasts. And now to today's program. One of the most fascinating stories playing out in the news this week is the general freakout on the part of the chattering classes about whether billionaire Elon Musk will be able to reset Twitter to being a forum where free speech is a given after years of political censorship. The primary focus of that controversy right now is his decision to let former President Donald Trump back onto the platform. Let's leave aside, for a moment, the endless debates about Trump. The point about the effort to silence him is not whether or not Trump is right about anything or a force for good in the body politic, but about the idea of a relatively small number of people, the oligarchs of Silicon Valley and their allies among global elites and the media, should have the power to censor political discourse on what has become, for good or for ill, the virtual town square of 21st century life. After all, it hasn't just been Trump who was censored on Twitter and elsewhere on the internet or even the successful effort to suppress reporting about Biden family corruption before the 2020 election. The real problem with internet censorship has been the way it dovetails with efforts to impose a wholesale change in our civilization in order to implement ideas about it economics, environmentalism, and the woke catechism of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Just as important is the way the corporate media, as well as big tech, have moved to shut down discussions of efforts to push back against the conventional wisdom that is built upon the foundation of these toxic ideologies like critical race theory and intersectionality. That applies equally to the silencing of debate about how the coronavirus pandemic was handled, its origins, or whether any of the measures promulgated to mitigate the impact of the crisis did more harm than good. We understand it when these discussions are focused on specific controversies, like trying to silence Trump, or critical race theory indoctrination, or efforts to impose transgender ideology in the schools or in public discourse. But what is also necessary is to pull back from our exclusive focus on the specific and look to see if there is a broader pattern of work in these struggles, as well as the efforts of those seeking to reset the way we think about topics as diverse as gender, public health education, history, and the arts. We need to ask, what does it mean that as a society we were prepared to give up every basic freedom in the middle of a public health emergency? The issue isn't just whether or not the draconian impact on our economy and lifestyles from moving from capitalism to a world governed by the thinking behind the Green New Deal is acceptable. How is it that we now live in a world where global technocrats, allied with big tech moguls, 
can both monitor everything about our lives on the internet and then easily restrict our ability to do anything about it. Why is it that the deeply influential World Economic Forum, the so-called Davos set, where global elites from movie stars to royalty to liberal politicians have an annual hangout, is promoting these ideas about resetting the Western world's social, economic, and moral structures. Why is this being done now? And how will these schemes affect all of us? And why are the people behind these ideas so desperate to seek to shut down discussion of all of this? Blaming it all on global elites or a Swiss conference group sounds like a crackpot conspiracy theory cooked up by those who dwell in the fever swamps of the far right or the far left. But after what has happened, and in some cases is still happening during the COVID-19 crisis, and how at the same time we were willingly giving up our freedoms to supposedly avoid killing grandma, and internet censorship spiked and woke ideologues and the Black Lives Matter movement grabbed more power over our lives and public discourse. Are we really supposed to think that there is nothing worth talking about with regard to all of this? The impact of this discussion goes beyond the strictly political or even those about economics. It embraces just about everything, including health, the environment, and the arts. One of the people contemplating all of this is author Michael Walsh, and I'm especially happy to have the opportunity to talk with him today. Michael Walsh is the author of 16 novels and nonfiction books, numerous screenplays, and was previously the longtime classical music critic for Time magazine. His most recent books have explored key struggles for Western civilization, including bestsellers like Last Stands. He's the editor of the website The Pipeline, which provides commentary on important political and cultural issues. And his most recent work is as editor and co-author of Against the Great Reset, 18 Theses Contra the New World Order, which is contributions from some of the most distinguished writers and thinkers, such as Victor Davis Hanson, Douglas Murray, Roger Kimball, and the late Angela Cotevilla. Michael Walsh, welcome to Top Story. Thank you very much, Jonathan. It's really a pleasure to be with you. Well, thanks so much for taking the time to join us. Uh, I'm a fan of your work and... um, really interested in having this discussion. Uh, I want to start by asking you to explain exactly what is the Great Reset that your um, collection is against, and some more about the man who seems to have popularized that phrase, the World Economic Forum uh, head, Klaus Schwab, whom you have very accurately described as someone who is the living incarnation of a Bond movie villain down to the German accent. Um, On the surface, you know, it's like blaming the ills of the world on Davo, the Davos set or Schwab seems like a conspiracy theory. But why do you believe what's at play here is actually vitally important? Well, I like to take a man at his own word. And when uh, he says he's going to do something or is something, there's no reason to disbelieve him. And in this case, Herr Schwab uh, has, uh, as the head of the World Economic Forum in Davos, Switzerland, uh, has been a very public proponent of something called the Great Reset. So I'm always amused when some people on the left say, well, it's a right-wing nut conspiracy theory. And if it is, then they have to include Schwab and King Charles and uh, a whole bunch of other, Bill Gates, a whole bunch of other famous people in the in their very own conspiracy. Uh, Schwab, uh, as I said, runs the World Economic Forum. It's based in Geneva, but every winter, generally, until COVID, they would have a meeting up in Davos, Switzerland, which is, as uh, literature fans know, the site of Thomas Mann's great novel, The Magic Mountain, uh, takes place in Davos in a tuberculosis sanatorium as a symbol of ailing Europe on the eve of World War I. So Schwab has done us literary fans the uh, very good deed of uh, <laughs> living up to Mann's dyspeptic view of what the future could be. They uh, they call it the Great Reset. Uh, Schwab co-wrote a book called COVID-19, colon, The Great Reset. They've put out multiple videos on the WEF site called The Great Reset. So we just decided to take them at their word and say, okay, The Great Reset, and let's have a look at it. And what we found is fairly horrifying if you are a free market capitalist, Adam Smith, center-right, uh, traditional conservative, uh, you don't want any part of it. And hence, that's 
our reason for producing the book and the title Contra, you know, obviously evokes both Luther in the 95 Theses against Roman Catholicism or uh, to take another example, one I'm in the middle of right now, Tertullian, the early Christian uh, philosopher of the, I guess, the third century, uh, writing against Marcion, who was a, a heretic of the, deemed a heretic of the time. Um, uh, Cicero writing his uh, theses contra Mark Anthony. Uh, he wrote a series of Philippics. And of course, the original Philippics themselves, which were written by Demosthenes against Alexander the Great's father, Philip II. So, uh, have I brought in enough classical references yet? I'm, I'm I, I love it. You can keep going, but you know, I, I think that's enough for our audience. Okay. But, um, but yeah, I mean, obviously, you've set the you know that you know what exactly is at play here. Let me just first take a step back for a moment and ask you, what brought you personally to this battle after a long and highly successful career as a music critic, novelist, historian? Um, why start what I guess what some people would consider tilting at windmills, fighting the establishment in this manner yep. at a time, you know, when most of people might say, well, you know, let alone people who have had your kind of success would just say, OK, it's not my fight. Uh, well, I think, you know, no writer ever voluntarily quits. You, you get fired by publishers and your readers, uh, essentially, as, or as we say in Hollywood, if, if the phone don't ring you know you're dead. So it's, it's, that's one, one element of it. Two is uh, I started a website about two and a half years ago called The Pipeline, the-pipeline.org. It's devoted to energy issues um, such as, well, energy itself, uh, oil production, global warming, a lot, and a lot of ancillary things that have developed too. COVID and the and arts lockdown. too. I mean, I've, I, you know, there's a lot on there. It's amazing. So as we were doing this, uh, my colleagues and I said, uh, we would like to do a book, maybe a book a year, a book every two years, based on what we're doing at, at, the, at the website. And our first choice was The Great Reset, because it, it was COVID had just started to become a negative factor in our lives. And we thought it was time to engage as many people uh, as we could to start contributing in a more... A solid way, less ephemeral way rather than simply a website and get something between hardcovers. So with the cooperation of Adam Bellow, who's a wonderful editor and has uh, previously uh, edited my book, uh, Last Stands, which came just before this book, uh, Adam has his own publishing company now. He took it on and uh, I wrote letters to uh, people I knew and people I didn't know. And here we are. We, so we got a total of uh, 17 writers involved. I wrote the introduction and the final essay. And one of our authors uh, unfortunately died uh, shortly after his essay came in. That's the late Angelo Cotavilla, who was a dear friend and inspiration to so many of us. Uh, so the book's dedicated to Angelo. Okay. There are some who might dismiss the World Economic Forum as just a glorified conference and that those involved are being mostly attention seekers or kibbutzers in public policy, uh, you know, like movie stars or, as you say, Britain's King Charles, uh, all of whom arrive at uh, climate change events in their own private jets. You refer to them, uh, you have referred to them as malevolent do-gooders. Yeah. But specifically, why should we take them seriously or regard them as a clear and present danger to our way of life, as opposed to just people who show up and, you know, say stupid things or make terrible recommendations. Right. Well, it could be that they're crazies like people at Hyde Park Corner in London just shouting at the clouds or the people you see uh, wandering around the streets of New York City increasingly <laughs> these days. It's almost like being back in New York in the 70s. Uh, except these guys have money and they have political power and they have a tremendous amount of reach. Uh, Schwab and Et Alia have uh, created a training program for young politicians that go through their uh, institute in Davos uh, and in Geneva. And among them are the current Canadian Prime Minister, uh, Justin Trudeau. Uh, our very own Tulsi Gabbard uh, is, was, went through the training program. Uh, it's all there on their very own website. I, I, to anyone who says this is just some kind of lunatic uh, thing that some 
Irishman dreamed up after drinking too much. That they would be referring to me, of course. Uh, I would say just go on their website and have a look. Let them speak for themselves. So they've got the money. Now, are they some vast Bondian you know, conspiracy to take over the world? Not in movie terms, but I would say it, that's their their goal. Like any partisans, they believe in their cause and they they are evangelists for their cause. There's nothing more dangerous than a, an evangel zealot and an evangelist combined in one person. Just look at St. Paul. He went pretty far with that, didn't he? Uh, given no, no internet in the first century. But uh, true believe or Lenin, uh, true believers believe, and they want you to believe too, even if it, uh, even if they have to do it at gunpoint. So I'm very wary of people like that. Yeah, on one foot, what is their agenda um, for somebody, you know, one of our, you know, members of our audience who never heard of Klaus Schwab? Um, what is what does he want? You know, what are all these do? What are all these malevolent do-gooders? What? How do they want to change our lives? Well, they want to smile at you, as they do. I uh, advise everyone to go on their site and look up Great Reset videos and have some young, happy, chirpy 20-something say, you'll own nothing and be happy. That, in a way, that's a brilliant slogan, really. Uh, why that's appealing to people, I'm not sure. But then again, maybe I'm too old. Apparently, a lot of young people agree with this because you see how... Uh, uh, enthusiastic they've become about socialism. Uh, the Great Reset wants you to own nothing, so you'll rent everything. And you see this happening now in industrial things. Uh, even the cars you buy spy on you and can gauge your speed and can tell you, uh, you know, they'll be able to tell you where you may or may not go uh, eventually. But a lot of the features now in new cars, you have to pay for them on an annual basis, otherwise they're disabled electronically. That's that's one thing. They want you to live uh, not in houses or places like you and I obviously do with rooms that have lots of books in them. They want you to live in a high-rise apartment. Uh, they want you to own nothing, to rent everything. They don't want you to drive anywhere. Freedom of movement will be out because it, cars will be electric. That's part of the push for electric cars. Uh, electric cars can be turned on and off at whim from a central location. Uh, and they mostly want you to eat bugs. I think this is my favorite part of the whole scheme. What exactly does that mean? I mean, I well, guess getting rid of getting rid of getting meat, rid of, uh, is that part yes. of it? Yes. Oh, yeah. Well, you see the push now for non-meat meat. That's coming. You see it every day, a little more. Uh, I live uh, a great deal of the time in Ireland, and my where my grandmother was born. Uh, so that site has, is a – cattle grazing is what we do in this – part of Ireland that goes back thousands and thousands of years. And the Irish government is now trying to drive us all out of business by restricting cattle. Uh, to brief aside about that, in, in Irish culture, cattle is the storehouse of value. It is the means of exchange. It goes back to our earliest myths that, that date back to the time of the Torah, to the Iliad and the Odyssey, to Hesiod, uh, ours is called the cattle raid of Cooley. So it's about cattle and that's so much. Anyway, they want cattle gone because they produce methane and they take up too much land and you shouldn't eat meat and, and, and. It's like you all suddenly were condemned to the third grade in Sister Mary Ignatius's class where I grew up in which everything you do is subject to immediate punishment. Uh, that's not a world I want to live in anymore. And I certainly don't want to eat bugs. So, but uh, you can go on our website, the hyphen pipeline.org and read all about bugs. Just look up our many stories we've done about how yummy bugs can be for you. Well, um, they that have steak. Sounds... Yeah. yeah, right. Yeah. yeah, bug steak. Great, thanks. Um, this sounds like the sort of the uh, the inspiration for the Green New Deal that Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez uh, unveiled a couple of years ago. Um, you know, is there a direct line sort of between Davos and, you know, sort of this, this political agitation in America, um, which is now being parroted by, of course, by President Biden, who, you know, you know, on the one hand promises to shut down coal plants, but then goes to, you know, when it comes to, you know, energy producing states like Pennsylvania, they say, no, 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 I didn't mean it. Um, it, it this is the same thing, isn't it? Yeah, well, uh, the, the Green New Deal is an offshoot of the whole overall ethos of the Great Reset, and it's, it's part of... Uh, 
you know, they have bud, buzzwords. I spent uh, six years behind the Iron Curtain uh, between 85 and 91. So uh, I speak German and I spent a lot of time in the Soviet Union right up to the end. I left just before the coup against Gorbachev in 91. And I was there when Chernobyl blew up. That was amusing. And then I was in Berlin when the wall came down. In fact, I helped take it down personally. So I've seen this movie before up close and personal. And this is just the next iteration of the control freakism that zealots need to impose on anybody. The idea of freedom of choice and free will and the free market and the invisible hand is not only alien to them, it's antithetical to everything they stand for. They want to believe that everything can be controlled, that there are laws, there are proscriptions and prescriptions. You know, the old joke in Germany is that everything that is not expressly allowed is forbidden. So that's pretty much your choice there. We're dealing with that. Ocasio-Cortez is, of course, an idiot, but she uh, is symptomatic of her generation in that they believe, and I guess this is the essence of it, Jonathan, they believe there are no practical consequences to anything they believe. In other words, their life will go on just fine. You, on the other hand, will change, comrade. Uh, and, and so when- And this is, this is basically about socialism. I mean, people dismiss yeah. it when, when we- when we throw around the world root word socialism uh, these days, but this is in, in, at its essence socialism, and that speaks to you know actually a much greater threat to our freedoms than whether we can eat meat or not, doesn't it? Yes, that's but but it's part of it. The control freakism is part of it. A couple of years ago, uh, we organized a debate on socialism versus capitalism at the Institute of World Politics in Washington D.C. It was uh, the fall of 2019, uh, and I, I organized that and selected four young people, mostly from the Jacobin magazine, and four uh, older conservatives. And not all of them older, but some of them. And I must say, the young Jacobins were terribly effective. They were very good. I, I was moderating, and I sort of felt myself rooting for them because they were so persuasive in with that uh, the ardor of, of of young people who believe in something that's transparently false, and yet you you don't want to be rude and tell them they're idiots. So they they have adopted socialism as a as a virtue signal uh, that they care. And I remember the Soviets saying this, <laughs> the same thing back in the the eighties, just as Chernobyl was blowing up. They don't care, uh, but they want to make sure that you spout the notion that they care. It's 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 about control more than anything. I think the deeper I get into this, I'm writing a, a new book now about, uh, there's a sequel to my last Stan's book, which was a book about uh, great battles in history where one side gets wiped out and but kind of wins in the end. And I'm now writing about great turning point battles. And it, it, it always comes down when you look at the great commanders from in this case, uh, uh, Agamemnon, in, in starting with the Iliad, uh, to, to Alexander, to Caesar, to the Emperor Constantine at the Milvian Bridge, to, uh, and I'll go right up to 9-11, uh, control and convincing you by any means necessary, which is one of their favorite expressions, as you recall, I'm sure you're old enough to remember the 60s as I am, by any means necessary means if we have to kill you, we will. That's it. Once you know that about them, then you know who you're dealing with. So this, I thought that uh, Jonah Goldberg's book, Liberal Fascism, the best thing about it was the cover with the smiling little happy face with the Hitler mustache on it, really said everything you need to know about these people. They're socialists, whether they call themselves socialists, communists, national socialists, fascisti, whatever, they're the same guys. Yeah, liberal fascism is fascism, whether you know whether they're calling themselves Bolsheviks or or not. Yeah, um, it is in essence, um, you know, a group of people telling other people how to live and willing to do anything to 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 get their way and saying that they're doing it for our own good. Um, speaking about doing things what, that we're supposed to think for is for our own good. Why is understanding what happened during the pandemic so important to this discussion? And it's played out in against the Great great Reset, irrespective of what anyone might think about the danger from the virus or the efficacy of the vaccines. And how, how is the idea, which is touched upon in the book, um, 
about treating science or some ideas about various orthodoxies, orthodoxies about scientific discussions have become something like a religion? And how does this impact our, our, our everyday life? Well, do we have an essay on that topic by Richard Fernandez, uh, who's uh, he's a Filipino who lives in Australia, uh, is a colleague of mine at PGA Media when we were both columnists there. And I asked Richard to do it because he's got such an original take on everything he encounters, I think, is, makes him so brilliant. And he, he's written an essay about science and religion and how, in effect, they are the same thing for some of these people. And uh, I should add, as a personal note, I had my very first COVID test yesterday. I'm so proud. I think I'm the last person in America to finally get a, a COVID test. But I have to because I have to go into the hospital in the hospital. Uh, tomorrow for a brief procedure, and they demand, you know, proof of uh, proof of comradeship, uh, as is the only way to put it, since we're well well past the COVID panic. I think they used it though as a well, they admit they used it. I don't think this. They say they did as a beta test for what can we force the population to do under the flimsiest of circumstances, and with solely an appeal to fear and authority and get them to give up their fundamental constitutional freedoms, which as you probably noticed, went right out the window the day they announced the lockdowns. First Amendment, gone. And it will never come back. That That is the problem. Once you, was, especially on the left, once you establish a precedent, it's the Brezhnev doctrine. We've, we've now taken Czechoslovakia, Czechoslovakia may never go back to freedom ever again. Or like Islam, once, once we plant the flag of Allah, that's it, it's, and if Christians come to them and say, knock, knock, St. Sophia Cathedral, can we have our cathedral back, please? Because it ain't yours. They'll laugh at us because they'll say it is now, Buster. Uh, that is that is the left. We won't its... even mention the, the Temple Mount in this discussion. <laughs> well, I mean, we can, you, you, there's a whole long litany of things, right? Yeah, right. Uh, exactly. Yeah, I was just going back to 1453, but we could go all the way back to the Arab conquest of uh, of Jerusalem. And what, what year would that be? Uh, Six something, I, yeah, I, I right, yeah, uh, seventh century. So the, the that's the notion on the left is once we take it, it's always ours, and so we will fight you, like Stalin said at Stalingrad, not one step back. We will never voluntarily relinquish any power we've established over you, and that's COVID. I mean, COVID may have been a lot of things, but what it really was, in essence, in my crazy right wing nut opinion was a way to establish the uh, precedence of control. And here you are. Do you have a First Amendment anymore? No. Did you have freedom of religion during COVID? No. Did your synagogue shut down? My Catholic Church did, disgracefully, absolutely disgracefully, uh, and has caused a lot of us cradle Catholics to rethink our attitude uh, towards it. No. Uh, what else? You didn't have freedom of assembly anymore, did you? No. Well, unless you were Black Lives Matter rioters, then you had freedom, freedom of assembly. So doesn't that tell you something? At what point do people finally wake up? And now I sound like, you know, a prophet crying in the wilderness. But at some point, even Sherlock Holmes can put two and two together and get four. And this is where we're at. Yeah, I, I think that's undoubtedly true. Our civil liberties went right out the window. And you know, I can recall, you know, somebody asking the governor of New Jersey about it. And he was like, well, that's, you know, that's not something I'm willing to talk about. Like, so what? Right. Um, and, and this really, uh, you know, it, it, you know, I guess, you know, you can call it a conspiracy theory. But once you do establish that, um, you know, sort of the powers that be can suspend something for a public health emergency that became really for two years, you know, a permanent temporary public health emergency in which everything was suspended or could be suspended, um, then all the rules do go out, you know, do go out. And that not coincidentally, that's when Black Lives Matter, you know, and critical race theory, you know, sort of uh, ascended the public square in a way and, and ch you know, helped change the way our discourse operates. And, you know, it, it affected everything uh, throughout society. And our elections were conducted. I've made a big point of this the last two weeks in my column mm -hmm. for the pipeline is they changed the rules. So it doesn't do conservatives or Republicans or whatever the anti group is to show up on election day because the election's already over. It's been over for six weeks, thanks to early voting. They've already got it one in the bag. 
they sat there and laughed at those polls because they knew it. Biden is stupid, but he's 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 got a kind of evil Irish cunning to I'm ashamed of the fact that my mother and his mother are both members of the Finnegan clan. I hope we're not related. But he was laughing at those polls because he knew he had the game fixed and it was already won. And today's column, I, I talk about yeah, the, the, movie the Fetterman State. debate took place after early voting. It's seven hundred thousand votes had taken place. Yeah, taken exactly. Count. It's and one guy is the Rutabaga, and one guy was actually dead who got elected because of the gap between early voting and the actual uh, day of the election. It's it's a real problem what this COVID thing did to us, and the fact that we surrendered without a shot fired. Uh, speaks very poorly, I think, of the notion of freedom throughout the West. Looking beyond the, spe the specifics about the pandemic, although we could spend you know much more time about that, how does the Great Reset fit into our thinking about the rise of communist China as a, a global superpower? Um, or is that, too, just another conspiracy theory on the right, and we're not supposed to be paying attention to the way the Chinese have uh, exploited it, and also the way they're, you know, they, you know, sort of restrict, you know, uh, Xi has sort of uh, decided that uh, China was too free. Um, of course, it wasn't very free, but now they're, they're still doing lockdowns of whole cities. Um, you know, he, talk about, you know, it's a piece I wrote in The Federalist. You know, it's, it, by the way, it's a very convenient tool for totalitarians, isn't it? They're just no, showing us is. that. Well, the Chinese are the role model for the left because they are they are top down totalitarianisms in which a small group, v, it's very similar to the Bolsheviks in Russia, were able to seize power in the midst of uh, a societal calamity. So uh, the Bolsheviks, is, as you know, uh, didn't start the Russian Revolution; they just absorbed it from the Kerensky seized government. control of it. Yeah. Yeah, they just took control of it, and then and then then it was off to the races. The the Chinese communists took advantage of you know a very long, prolonged Chinese civil war that actually started in the nineteenth century, and continued until finally a strong man seized power. I have some thoughts about China, and I argue with my good friends on the right about this. I I'm not a my God, the Chinese are coming, we're all doomed. Or the you know I remember when the Japanese were coming and we were all doomed. Um, if you look at China, I'll just say this briefly about China, they are a nullity militarily. They cannot fight at all. They are probably the biggest nation with the most inept record in military matters in the history of the world. To put it this way, they're so bad that the Arabs beat them at the Battle of Talas back around the 7th or 8th century uh, and stopped any... Chinese expansion to the West. They're not a hegemon hegemonic power. They are, however, commercially hege hegemonic, and, they, and they've done that all over the world by planting Chinese communities that stay very Chinese. Uh, Singapore is a very good example of this. Uh, Malaysia, if, for those of you who are scholars of Malaysian history and the fraught relationships between the overseas Chinese in places around Southeast Asia, they're not terribly popular. The Vietnamese gave them a beating that they won't forget. Uh, right after the Vietnam War ended for us, the Chinese decided to take on the Vietnamese and lost handily. So I don't think the Chinese are going to be, it, it's not going to be Red Dawn with them parachuting in over Idaho anytime soon. They are dangerous in that they buy people and they, they work through subornation and bribery. And they've certainly bribed at least, what, 50%, is that a generous estimate? That's maybe too low of the United States government to allow them to do what they have, what they want. I mean, why in the world would you allow them to buy property in the United States? Why would you? Just if you were running a realistic country. But only DeSantis has stood up to this and said he doesn't want the Chinese buying uh, property in Florida. Uh, and we're it's gonna not have just this America. Out. You know, they, they, their influence goes around the world. It's an issue in yeah. Israel. Um, which has provoked some, you know, some some tension with between the United States. You know, they were they were Chinese companies looking to operate the Haifa port. Yeah. Well, I've had a lot of friends in Hollywood who've lost their shirts to thinking they had a deal with the Chinese and uh, didn't, and literally lost millions and millions and millions of dollars. Uh, and one of them told me uh, it was one of those things where he had a commitment to them for investing in something. 
And then one day they vanished. He never heard from them again. They had a close company, almost with overnight, because they just vanished. Uh, I've dealt with them a couple of times on movie projects, and getting them to pay you is almost impossible. Uh, if you get anything from them, it's a miracle. And usually at some point they will say, well, we're not going to do this anymore. And you'll say, well, we have a contract. And they'll say, this is my favorite. Circumstances have changed. Therefore, the contract is abrogated. In other words, they have no respect for Western notions of contractual, uh, uh, enforceable agreements between parties economically. So that's just, you can see I'm not a big fan of the Chinese. Partly I, I, I grew up in Hawaii, so I, I grew up with them to a certain extent as a boy. And I, I had a chance uh, as a youth to, because I was in the, my father was a Marine Corps officer, we traveled all over the world. And you lose your illusions about anybody, for good or bad, uh, once you actually meet them, uh, which goes against all, every liberal philosophy there is. But that's just the way, that was the luck of the draw I got. Yeah, well, actually, you know, you bring it up, um, you know, the film industry is, and the content of, of, of what Hollywood is producing is, is deeply influenced by China, isn't it? Because, you know, so many of them are besotted with the idea of getting into the Chinese markets. Actually, it, it, it's affected sports, too, with the NBA. We've seen it with the NBA trying to silence people uh, criticizing China. Um, you know, it's, it's more than that's certainly not a conspiracy theory. They're influencing you know, our, our, you know the, the content of our entertainment as well as, uh, you know, the way our, our sports are operating, operating. Well, Hollywood will always go where the money is. I went in the direction of the Japanese during the 80s, and uh, that's, that's the nature of that beast. The, the irony is, the little-known fact, is that the Chinese market uh, is probably the most racist market in the world. They don't want to see black people in their movies at all. So when Hollywood, Hollywood will often make a different version of a movie and cut out as many of the black characters as they can, because the Chinese public doesn't like black people. And that's a very unpalatable truth that we don't want to face, but we have to understand that that's very much a part of it. It's why the Chinese Hollywood thing has never quite worked, because Hollywood's quite woke now, right now, and there's obviously great black actors, and writers, and directors, and I've dealt with many of them. Uh, it's just that in that particular market, they're not welcome. It's worse than the Old South. Uh, the world is a complex place, and I think that the basis of what we're talking about here is people's, the, the, on the left, they see the world as they wish it were, and on the right, we tend to see it as it actually is, however unpleasant it might be at that particular moment. Mm. There are so many interesting and important discussions in Against the Great Reset in each of the 18 essays, which span the spectrum from politics to economics to culture. Um, what unites all of this discussion that makes it a coherent whole when you read the book? Hmm. I don't know. Can I ask you that question? Because I'm so, I mean, I have my nose pressed right up against that glass, but did you see a common thread? I, well, I, mean, I think I'm the gonna... common, th just as a reader, I think the common thread well, I was I was interested in your point of view more than my own. I think the common thread was the idea of how culture, how like top down culture impacts our lives and whether it's economics and, you know, sort of the socialist um, woke, imp, you know, impulse and how it can impact everything from economics, politics to entertainment, um, you know, and, and that's. Um, you know, I, I, that was, that was my take. I, it seemed very natural to me, but I was wondering how you approach it as an editor, speaking as an editor. Um, I know when I'm pulling things together, I kind of try to have an idea, um, sort of what was your idea, you know, when you were discussing, you know, the, these with your writers? Well, this is very good, Jonathan. Thank you. Uh, of course, when you start a project like this, you have nothing. Uh, I, I often tell uh, young writers, every project you, you're going to do starts ex nihilo, and it comes out of your head. That's it, the end. Uh, so there better be something in that head, first of all, that is going to get this from thought to page to publication to influence. Hopefully you can't control that. Secondly, you know, we started working on this book two years ago. So whatever I thought two years ago, uh, it has now come out to be this. And it's changed somewhat uh, because the t circumstances around it have changed. The time has changed. We're two years down the road from 
a lot of the origination. And thirdly, uh, when I selected the writers, I, I took people whom I have known for a long time, people I've never met, uh, people who I c cold called effectively. Uh, and, and all I asked of them was, uh, we're going to do a book on the Great Reset, and I'd like you to write about X. Not how to do it, just X, capitalism. So Comrade Black said, great, I'll write about capitalism. Mike Anton said, I'll write about socialism. Uh, Fernandez uh, said, I, I want to do the confluence machine. And I said, great. So when I had enough to pick from, I chose them. And then I commissioned them, not by telling them what to do. And we went through a lot of editing because I'm picky that way. Uh, and I, the compliment, best compliment I got was from Conrad Black, who said to me the other day, you know, Michael, I've never had to work so hard on a piece in my life. I said, good, because I want this book. It's not transient journalism. It's not something we publish today to gone tomorrow. We're writing from two years for two years from now. And so I don't want contemporary references. I don't want Trump, Trump, Trump. I don't want whatever. I want it as if we're writing this book for 10 years from now, that it will last and that people can pick it up and that it has principles in it that are immutable or at least relatively immutable. And I think we've accomplished that. Whatever you think of any of the individual essays, the overall conception, uh, I think we've accomplished something that you could pick this book up 10 years from now and go, oh, boy, that's true. And that's really all we can do as writers. I mean, you know this yourself as a writer and intellectual. All we can do is propose. We can't make people do anything. That's the guys with guns that do that. Uh, but you need us to tell you what's the principle you're fighting for. And an arm, you know, as Napoleon said, he'd rather have an arm, army of sheep led by a lion than an army of lions led by sheep. And, and, and that's our, our job is to be the lion because a lot of the people are sheep. But once they get going in the right direction, they're very tough to beat. And we respect their wishes and wills in a, in a, in a Republican democracy like we have. But I think leadership is really important. So that's what we try to do. Yeah, yeah. Um, again, pulling out of the sort of the direct contacts and speaking for myself as someone who thinks, writes, advocates on Jewish issues and specifically the rise in anti-Semitism around the globe. One question I have for you is how has the embrace of the Great Reset idea by global elites affected the way we think about anti-Semitism and helped it spread at a time when it is clearly spreading? You, you know, this is an interesting question. I'm not Jewish, obviously, but I, I, I've i worked, I, I went to music school. So how Jewish was the Eastman School of Music in 1967? Pretty, right? And all my best friends were kids from Queens and had gone to the High School of Music and Art in, in Manhattan and then I've worked in journalism and publishing in Hollywood. And so I'm very philo-Semitic when it comes to that. And one of the questions that comes up is, well, aren't you an anti-Semite if you're against the Great Reset? And I don't know where that question comes from. I was just asked it recently in another conversation. And I would like to ask you, if I can turn it back on you for a minute, why does being against the Great Reset imply that one is an anti-Semite? I can't connect those two dots. Can you help me with that? Um, I, I think it's the, I mean, maybe I was asked, trying to ask a leading question, uh, guilty probably. Um, I think it's the opposite because I think in our culture today, the greatest force spreading anti-Semitism, certainly in the United States, is sort of wokeism and cult critical race theory. And, you know, the, the way that that legitimizes and de grants a permission slip for anti-Semitism by dividing us and declaring that Jews are whites, that Israel is an oppressor, apartheid state, when it's anything but. I, I think sort of this top-down wokeism is the greatest enabler of anti-Semitism and the greatest force trying to suppress the expression. One of the one of the concepts that is explored in, in, in Against the Great Reset is about nationalism and identity. And I think you know, if there's anything that Davos is against, it's sort of, it's against national identity. It's against people speaking up for who they are. And if, you know, that, that is, although sometimes people identify universalism and certainly, you know, Judaism is both a universal faith and identity as well as a very tribal, you know, particularistic one. But if you're only, but if, we, if you're only doing the universal, you're basically squelching Jewish identity you're saying Israel is illegitimate. You're saying Jewish identity is illegitimate. Yeah, well, I think obviously the Jews have a special problem, and we, we know what that is because it's a dispersed culture that has remained uh, terrifically uh, uh, 
coherent in in it, not only in its religious ideals in the practice of Judaism and question of who's a Jew, and yet the community has spread all around the world. So you've got, a, well, you know, this is well better than I do. There's a conflict within the Jewish community. Are Jews white or are we not white? Are we uh, international socialists or are we national is, Israeli nationalists? Is, and, and I think in some cases, the Gentile community stands back and says, yo, sort this out, guys. So tell, tell us, what, what do you want? Now, I, I know where you're coming from, but there are, as you know, there are people on the other side who are also Jewish who are against Israel. I mean, some of the most anti-Israel people I know are American Jews who think it's, it's a warmongering, neo-Nazi, colonial, I mean, you've heard it all before. Or and worse, had, a red state. <laughs> Well, I've had Hollywood producers say this to me, and I say to them, X, you're Jewish. And he goes, I know. I, well, well, I'm staying out of this fight, right? This this is not my kind of bar fight. But I think that's a real a real problem in, in the Jewish community. And I think uh, those of any race, creed, color, et cetera, who subscribe to our general principles of freedom and self-determination and all these kind of class actually they're actually classical 18th century enlightenment principles that have been universalized uh we want you on our side no one wants to get into this fight but i boy i i hate to hear this i like i said i just heard it recently well if you're against the great reset you're an anti-semite well what king charles is jewish did i miss something did klaus schwab you know the <laughs> The Bond villain, uh, he's Jewish? Yeah. Good Lord. No, he's not. Yeah. No, and no. of course, the anti-Semites, you know, they, you know, the anti-Semite, you know, anti-Semitism is about the anti-Semites. It's not about what the Jews do. It's, you know, you know, the Jews are attacked because they're rich, because they're poor, because they assimilate, because they don't assimilate. It doesn't right. really matter because you they're here or because they're there. Um, right. Anti-Semites are just looking for it. But, uh, you know, I feel that sort of the, the globalism is a particular force against an exp the expression of Jewish identity and um, and very troubling. Just even for that alone, forget about everything else. Well, I think that's a case that needs to be made very strongly because, uh, as you know, there are plenty of people who say globalism is, in fact, the expression of Jewish Marxism on a grand scale. And so then you go down this rabbit hole and you have these endless conversations which go nowhere. But I think what you've long advocated and uh, what publications like the Tablet, which I think is a very, very good publication for, especially for Gentiles to read, to, uh, to see what the conversation is within the Jewish intellectual community. Uh, I think that's really important too. So I think what you're doing is really great. Well, thanks. Um, let me, you know, just before I, I, I want to also talk about the arts with you because that's very important to both of us, but. Let's talk about sort of, you know, you, as you said, we, we, you know, Against the Great Reset is, is something that is meant to be read, you know, as, not just today, but 10 years from now. And I think that's certainly true. But I, I was struck, you know, the, the, the con as we're speaking, you know, the sort of the headline controversy is, is Twitter going to be, um, you know, uh, it, it, is it going to remain, uh, you know, with political censorship or is Elon Musk going to open it up? He just let Donald Trump back on for good or for ill. And the idea is then sort of the left is saying, well, if Twitter is going to have both sides, you know, we want to sink it. Um, this is, I think, very much related to this discussion about a great reset, because the great reset is not just resetting, you know, what we're going to eat or whether we can drive or fly. It's also about what is access acceptable discourse and what is not. Yes. And, and certainly we saw that during the pandemic when a primary focus was on shutting up people who were asking questions that, you know, the people taking away our civil liberties didn't want asked. Well, I got kicked off Twitter early. I was very pleased to have gotten kicked off even before Donald Trump. <laughs> yes, I know. Out. I don't know why. Uh, I, I Sometimes I write to them in my best third grade handwriting and say, dear teacher, what did I do? And they say, targeted harassment. Which basically is saying you're not allowed to have an opinion contrary to the groups, comrade. So that's targeted harassment to them. Uh, I think what Musk is doing is driving them crazy, which we like to see. And it, it's it's always fun to watch the left reveal who they really are, which they are fascists deep down inside. They 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 demand obedience. They're very similar to Islam. It's why I think the radical left and Islam have such a 
cozy relationship other than that of suicide cult and death cult uh, in, in some D Saudi and torture chamber somewhere. But they do like the idea of imposing their view on everybody else. And what gives them great satisfaction is that you profess that they are right. Uh, you can pay the, the Jizya tax or you can be executed for your beliefs. Uh, but what they really want you to do is to say, yes, you're right, boss. And that's not something a self-respecting Western individual can ever do. And I think that's the crusade that they want I'm us to love Big playing. Brother. Oh, they they do want you to love Big Brother. Yeah, Big Brother has your best interests. Uh, uh, Orwell certainly right about that. And a lot of the dystopian writers were right in various aspects of the society they saw coming. Brave New World is much more about uh, anesthetizing the population with drugs and sex, but we see that that that's happening as well uh yeah it seems very realistic question, now it's a question of control and and are are you a sheep or are you a lion i mean it really is simple and the fact is i fear more people are sheep so therefore they must uh be showed that there is another path other than following the sheepdog who could turn out to be a wolf right um, as someone who writes about the arts myself i'm particularly interested in your take on how this mindset as well as wokeness is impacting the arts. Um, Harry Stein's essay in the book discusses how the left's domination of popular culture has distorted our public life, tell us what's funny, what's not. And certainly anyone who follows classical music knows that, you know, which is was your business for a long time, knows that every symphony orchestra and opera company in the US now has a woke commissar on, on staff whose purpose it is to guide hirings, repertory choices, and anything else they can get their hands on. Well, so now we're what just... happens? Yeah, what happens to the arts when civilization stops uh, being focused on creativity and extend, instead becomes blatantly political? Well, no one else is going to see this, right? This is just us talking on the telephone. So I'll I'll be frank <laughs> here. Uh, we have a few well, more all, listening. Uh, okay, uh, Harry's essay is wonderful. Uh, Harry's an old dear friend of mine, and Harry is a man of the left who read, got red pills, right, and and suddenly realized he was uh, on the wrong. And I think his essay is deeply personal. And Harry, he didn't struggle with it, but he kept saying, "I don't know, should I get into this?" I said, "Yeah." He said, "Is this too Jewish?" I said, "How can it be too Jewish? Come on, you're writing about humor for crying out loud." Uh, no, and I kept encouraging him to go as far as he wanted to go and say the truth as he saw it. And I was very happy with the way that piece came out because Harry's worked, you know, in all the same fields that I have and and that any of us who work in this sort of giant information business amalgamation. Uh, I, I like that very much. Harry's, Harry understands that with wokeism, there is no comedy. So there is no comedy now. You, 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 the only person who's still funny is Bill Maher. And I don't know Bill. I've spent some time with him years ago. And I always felt with him, as with David Mamet, who I only met after his conversion, so to speak. And his conversion in part is because he came back to Judaism and he understood the fundamental truths of what he was writing. And I, I remember saying to him, I said, the minute I saw Glenn, Gary Glenn Ross on Broadway, I knew you were one of us. <laughs> it was before he knew he was one of us, because you could feel it. Uh, Harry, Harry has seen the, the other side of this thing. Artists cannot be dictated to, the good ones. So in, again, in the Soviet Union, uh, I was there for the first time I went with Vladimir Horowitz when Horowitz went back for the only time in his life after he had fled uh, the Soviet Union in the 1920s. And it was quite an event. In fact, it was a cover story in time. And while we were there, Chernobyl blew up and it was uh, probably the highlight of my young life. Uh, but I, ha I got involved with a lot of the Soviet musical bureaucracy. And the dreary junk that they were turning out that was music for the people, for the revolution, was all instantly disposable. The composers who lived, who survived, whose music flourished, were the people who were the enemies of the state, like Shostakovich, for example, and uh, Prokofiev, to, to a lesser extent. Uh, you can't dictate what an artist should do, and no artist should be dictated to, but as we were saying about comedy, you know, Bill Maher occasionally will come up with the truth because he's still enough of deep down inside a conservative, the way he lives his life, 
except for the sex, drugs, and rock and roll that he's always talking about. Uh, he's a, he's he's deeply conservative about the values of the importance of the First Amendment, primacy, and freedom of expression. Carlin was the same way it's from the Irish side, right? Uh, well, Mars had George Irish Carlin, too. yeah. Uh, so just you can't tell me what to do, sister. You know that that that's part of our that's part of our culture. I I used uh, Nero, you know. <laughs> Everybody's yeah, I just I wanted to ask you because in yeah. your own concluding essay in the book, it, yeah. it focuses on of all people the Roman emperor Nero, yeah, and why his story should inform our discussion of these issues. Well, I Tell think it should. I, you know, Nero is the last of the Julio Claudian emperors. He's he's the end of that dynasty. He's actually Mark Antony's what grandson. Uh, three of the five Ro uh, first Roman emperors were related to Mark Antony, not to Julius Caesar or Augustus. Um, he. The point about Nero is he didn't think of himself as the emperor of Rome. He thought of himself as the greatest singer and poet and artist and charioteer ever. So what he wanted to be worshipped was not as a god emperor so much. I don't know if he was divinized during his lifetime or not. I forget. But as as the greatest artistic figure of the whole Roman world, which at that point is now quite large. It's not as big as it got under Trajan but 100 years later, but it's big. And that was what Nero went, wanted to go down in history. And, and the point is, I, I, I brought it up because he is the hero of the very first opera, Monteverdi's Coronation of Pompeia. Nero is the hero. And that duet that they sing at the end, Portimiro, is absolutely ravishing. And that you're writing it about one of history's great monsters tells you that art doesn't take sides. It speaks truth. And that's a very hard thing. Uh, for people to uh, come to grips with. And I am quite upset, I must say, at my dear friend, uh, Peter Gelb, who I've known for many, many 40 years, uh, at the Metropolitan Opera for the way they made Jimmy Levine into an absolute non-person uh, during the whole sort of Me Too gay version of the Me Too panic that, that set in. I, I, I've known Jimmy for, uh, forever. I wrote my first time cover story about Jim uh, and he was clearly one of the greatest musicians ever. He was the greatest. An important, a very important figure in American oh, musical he's just history. Superb. Yeah. And and when we first met, we didn't exactly see eye to eye inter interpretatively. And I remember I was sitting with him in Salzburg one time and said, you know, I'm I'm really here as a skeptic. So I I want to write. Time wants to do a cover story about you, and so I'm here to learn. What are you looking for that I am missing? Right? I'm not the the, the expert expert here. I, you are, but we're going to work in a way collaboratively to understand each other so I can write the best and most truthful thing about you that that I could. And I, I became very fond of him over the years, and we'd occasionally see each other at Bayreuth. It's interesting, speaking of Jewishness, I'll tell a story. I'm not sure I ever printed this. Um, I was with Jim once in Bayreuth or Salzburg, but I think he was on his way to Bayreuth to conduct in Wagner's own theater, right? Uh, which was where Hitler spent a lot of the war going to see the ring cycle. So it's very, very closely associated with National Socialism. Uh, and after the war, it had to be denazified. So Jimmy said to me once, he said, you know, there's two kinds of Jews, the kind that won't go to Germany and the kind that have to go to Germany. And he said, I'm the kind that has to go to Germany. And Jimmy went up to conduct Parsifal, which is Wagner's last opera. It's the most Christian, so to speak, uh, thematically, uh, it's Wagner's final statement sort of about everything. And the fact that Levine was invited to do that, he did it, and he did it so spectacularly well. Well, Parsifal's first conductor was uh, was Jewish. Well, uh, Hermann Levy, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So Wagner sought a Jewish conductor for that opera. He didn't want anybody Life is full of ironies, yeah. Well, even a, even a person like Wagner is highly complex. Uh, so anyway, there was Jim, and, and off he went to Bayreuth. And I, I think I heard that performance that year or, or in subsequent things. And I thought what that man did was so, uh, you know, brave and stunning is a word that left his words of ruin. But I thought Jim stood up for his principles and that the fact that uh, because of this sort of transient panic uh, of, over sexuality and sexual behavior, that he should have become unpersoned uh, effectively by the men, I think is really disgraceful. And I, hope that Peter uh, reassesses his position on this. Well, there were a lot of pictures down at the Met this year, if you've been. Uh, Placido Domingo's picture, portrait is down too. 
Um, yeah. I, I guess I didn't plan on talking about this, but or or about my personal you know grudge against Peter Gelb. Um, we could talk about Anna Trepka, lots of issues. But I guess um, I can't help but asking you because you, you, this speaks right to it. Uh, there's a new movie out called Tar about which, about a fictional conductor who winds up getting canceled in part because of being not woke and but mainly because of sexual impropriety. And it asks the question about whether it's really okay, you know, do do we need to you know erase such a person or are we losing such a thing by it? And I guess, um, you know, I, I think it's a morally serious film because it asks those questions. So I yeah, guess I, I, I haven't seen it, okay. uh, but I do think erasing people from history is something that Soviet communists do and not free Americans do. Uh, I I think, I mean. We haven't erased Nero. They don't get much worse than that guy, right? And yet, yeah, his monuments still live on. We still talk about him. Uh, he's a figure in multiple works of art, including, as I mentioned, Monteverdi's Popea. Uh, Wagner was not a particularly good person. I think he was arguably extremely not person. good. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and yet. Well, that brings think, up a lot. You know, that's that's a perpetual question about art, which I have. Yeah. I argue. Well, you can't confuse especially art, especially in with a Jewish man. context. Is it okay for us to to enjoy or appreciate his work if he was also a terrible person? And I think, I think it relates directly to this question of sort of uh, imposing politics on art, uh, because I think so much of what one hears coming out of you know when one goes to a, an orchestral concert at a major orchestra now, you're often you know fed some medicine. Um, some 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 composition by a member of a you know of a approved minority group, um, a, which has some sort of political theme or or not, and we're supposed to think it's okay when mostly it's terrible. Um, yeah. Well, uh, uh, you're being told that because this person fulfills these external qualities, it must be good. Therefore, you will like it, uh, and that's not the way any artist can approach art. Uh, I, some of my books, the first, my first novel was so so uh, violent and obscene that my sainted Irish mother said she sh should come and wash my mouth out with soap. And I thought, well, at least I've accomplished that mission. I wanted to show, it's a police thriller. There was a Book of the Month Club with a selection when it was as a debut novel, which I was very lucky to have that happen. Uh, but it's not for everybody. And it's, I think, probably now I'd never get it published. And it's just too brutal and too to uh, unflinching in its view of, of life. Um, what any artist that you like is unflinching in the view of life. Sugarcoating life doesn't create art. It creates propaganda. And uh, a real quick story about the propaganda. I was in Soviet Union. I, I put this in, I put this in the uh, Great Reset book. In fact, I was with the, the, the head of the Soviet Composers Union and we were meeting in a room filled with pictures of Shostakovich and Prokofiev and all the great Russian artists. And this guy, what's his name now, uh, 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 Tikhon Krenikov, had been one of the architects of the resolution of 1948, uh, uh, basically calling for the murder of these particular composers. And I said to him, how, can, how do you have the gall to sit here in this room with pictures of men that you tried to kill? Well, that didn't go over too big. But uh, uh, I, I, I was ready for with my answer because... <laughs> Because I was unarmed, so I better be ready with something. Uh, I said, "You, you're about to come to the United States." He asked when he got furious and screamed at me in Russian and every other language. Uh, he said, "How dare you ask me that question?" And I said, uh, "Because you're going to come to America." And this is '86, and that's the first question you're going to be asked about the resolution of 19 because they're very sensitive. Whatever with 1948, whatever 49, whatever 54. Um, it's the first question you're going to be asked, and I wanted to uh, do you the courtesy of having you be prepared for it. They're very sensitive about this sort of thing, and sure. the fact that they explode in anger over it tells you one thing. They know they're wrong. They just don't want you to point that out. Well, that's what woke commissars do, whether it's about the arts or, or about anything else that's the point of uh, Against the Great Reset. I think it impacts on... So many issues, uh, Jewish issues specifically, as I said, about anti-Semitism and others. Um, Michael uh, Walsh, thank you so much for coming on our show. I really enjoyed our conversation. No, it's an honor, Jonathan. Uh, I've been wanting to meet you for many years. I'm so happy well, we thank had you. this chance to thank do it. Thank you. Against the Great Reset is an important collection. I think it's a must-read for those who care about the future of the West. 
We also want to thank our audience. Uh, please remember to tune in every day for Top Story Daily Edition, whether you're listening to us on Spotify or any of the other podcast platforms, watching us live on Facebook or Twitter or on the JNS YouTube channel or on JBS TV. Please like and or subscribe to Top Story. Click on the bell for notifications and give us good reviews, please. Please write to us at editor at jns.org and let us know where you listen or watch the show and what you think about it. And remember, keep reading and thinking for yourself, and we'll see you again next week.